All right, let's see. Today's Torah portion, this week's Torah portion, Ra'i, which means to behold, to see. Uh, it's the 47th Torah reading. It's the fourth in the book of Devarim. That's the Hebrew name for De Deuteronomy, right? Um, and so I, I kind of look at this book kind of as a history lesson, uh, just a, kind of like a, a review of the entire Torah is taking place. And, it, and so we're going to set up where we're at, and we're going to see where God takes this. Um, right now, um, Moses, it's starting in chapter 11. Moses is standing before the people. Um, uh, there's two eras that are basically coming to an end at this time. Uh, the one era where the Israelites have been wandering around the desert for 40 years. Um, the, the new generation is awaiting to go into the land. And uh, uh, the older generation, the ones that rebelled against God, they have died off just like Yahweh had promised. Uh, the second era that's actually that's coming to an end is the era of Moses as being the mediator. So he is standing now here before the people, and he's trying to teach the generation before they go in. He's telling them, uh, he's refreshing them on the, the law. Uh, he's, he's giving them instruction before they go into the land. Um, he's letting them know how exactly they got to this place. You know, I, I would even venture to say that the, this generation probably has any recollection or, or remembers Egypt at all. So they've lived and watched God's provision in the desert, how he's miraculously taken care of them. So here they are. It's like the rookies are waiting at you know, the Jordan River, and they're about to go in. And so Moses is given his, his uh, instruction. Um, I think it's, uh, there, was a, there was a rabbi that said, and actually... The, I was going to say, too, that the, the Torah portion this week is, uh, Moses, is, is, there's just like a concurrent uh, theme that's going on here that, that takes place in Deuteronomy, to, and it's um, that you, we have a choice. We actually can choose, and God gives us a choice. I mean, it's been that way all along. You go back to the beginning in the garden, and there were two paths. There was the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So he gives us that choice. And uh, that is uh, what he's saying to them right now. The first thing he says, see, I set before you blessings and cursings. So you are blessed if you keep the commandments. You are blessed if you follow the decrees. You know, God gave the Torah to the people. He gave it as a covenant between Yahweh and his people. And if we obey everything that he's laid out, if they obeyed everything that's laid out, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the laws of the, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, if they follow those things, then they will be blessed. He's also very clear to show us if we don't follow those things, we will be cursed and we will be punished severely. And I thought about that, you know, the severely punished. And it's because, you know, that scripture in Luke that talks about um, too much is given, much is expected. Just think about this. Who was given... God's ways to teach the world. Israel. What does the scripture say about teachers? They will be judged more harshly. So the punishment would be more severe because they had been given a, a, a higher level of knowledge, a greater revelation of God and his ways and his word. So that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, I also uh, believe that, you know, it's easy when you talk about blessings and cursings. It's always a lot easier, or a lot feels a lot better to sit around and talk about the blessings. You know, we don't want to think about the cursings at all. And um, you know, I think about the Israelites standing there and they're hearing all this, the blessings and the cursings, and and it's so easy to walk away from that. Think about it. You're in here and you hear the word of God. You is spoken to you. You feel it convict your heart. You feel renewed. You step out that door. And you get right back in the world, and it's coming at you all the time, you know, compromise and so forth. So, um, you know, we need to understand the curses. We need to understand that they're not pleasant. You know, they're not good, and, and, and the choice is ours. Yeah, and I would just, uh, to dovetail off of that, I mean, it's, it's for our benefit because not only does it say i set before you life and death i set before you blessing and cursing but he also says it's my will that you choose life i want you to choose life and why it's not like god is some greek god up in the clouds throwing lightning bolts at us when we misbehave 
he gives us these, really, he's letting us see the future before it happens. It's, it's cause and effect. You know, he created the laws of the universe. He put everything into motion from the beginning. So he knows, he can see ahead the natural consequences of our actions, and he's warning us of the consequences of our actions. And uh, so he gives us our, the Torah. The Torah is called life uh, over and over and over again. Uh, read Psalm 119. So his commands, his ways, um, the front of the book, as uh, Pastor Jim likes to say, uh, uh, the whole book, really, I mean, it's for our benefit, for our blessing. And he gives us it uh, not to, to put us into bondage, but to, so that we would be blessed on this earth. That's really good. That's good. I think sometimes, um, you know, as a, as a culture, especially now, we, we don't understand the blessings and the cursings of God. I mean, we've been so inundated by, you know, concepts and philosophies of the culture. You know, coming out of the church, um, I can say from friends that I have in the church, they believe that the cursings are, you know, that was for the Jewish people. They don't even believe that it pertains to them. Uh, there's a, I read a story that was, um, there's a song called Blessed by Fred Heyman. Has anybody heard of that? Heard that song? You have? And um, this guy was saying he had, he, he had been in a mega church and came out of it and, and got into his Hebraic roots and Christian roots. And, um, and, and he had, still had friends in the church. And they asked him to come back. And of course, he, you know, okay, I'll go back because he's thinking, you know, I'm, it's hard to get, he wants to influence them too. And he goes back and they, they're singing that song. And after the song's over with, one of the people that were in the group or the choir that sang it, you know, said, I've got a word. So he stands up there and he says that, um, you know, this song that we're singing is in Deuteronomy where Moses is telling the children of Israel the blessings and the cursings. But you know what? I thank God and praise God today that that does not matter to us because we're not like the Jews. We are Christians. It doesn't matter what we do or how we act. We are still blessed because of the blood of Yeshua. That's dangerous, is it not? Very dangerous. I mean, I don't believe that, that God, Adonai, has laws or precepts or, or standards for one group of people and then, not, and then changes it for another group of people. I, I don't believe that's what... And, and so that is one of the constant battles or constant things to reveal to our, my brothers that are, are still in, in the church is, um, you know, God's law was given to all people and his instructions are good. It's life. That's very good. Well, there was a, a couple of passages uh, in this Torah portion that really stood out to me, and I kind of wanted to, uh, the, I guess the, the two themes that really stood out to me about this Torah portion, uh, one was faithfulness, and the other one was generosity. And so I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, passages, and um, you guys like my, my notes here. I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but, you know, he gives us the power to make our point, so um, <laughs> thought, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah, you guys will have to deal with me reading from this piece of paper, but um, wanted to uh, read a passage real quick. Um, uh, it's found in Deuteronomy 12, starting in verse 29, if you guys want to follow along. Yeah, Deuteronomy 12, uh, 29. So it says, When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess. And th this is uh, Moses, as David, uh, Pastor David explained earlier. Uh, he's telling them as they're about to go into the land, as Joshua is about to lead them into the land, uh, what they are to expect. And so he's giving them instructions upon when they enter the land. And so he says, when the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. 
for they have even burned they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods and so i uh i read that um as i was reading that you know it it really emphasizes how offensive this is to god he even gives a, a personal example like when you do this this is what it reminds me of like these nations they burn their own sons and daughters and so when you follow after them when you inquire about the way that these nations serve their gods and you do likewise unto me that is what i see and uh if you ever seen a uh, pastor jim's truth or tradition uh, uh teaching he talks about that about the origins of of christmas and easter uh and all of these things that actually come from pagan idolatry, uh, many of those traditions that come from pagan idolatry, and they show up in um, quote-unquote Christian celebrations even today, and things that, that would even seem harmless to us, um, many of us as, as Christians, because we just don't know, but there's two perspectives in the world. There's our perspective, and then there's the father's perspective and so what he's trying to communicate to us is how he sees this and um and so it's incredibly offensive in fact he even compares idolatry to adultery several times throughout the scriptures if you read um the book of hosea especially and and throughout jeremiah you know uh, jeremiah chapter 3 he talks about how he even divorced the uh, uh, house of israel because of adultery and uh, gave her a writ of divorce and so um so he compares it to adultery that that's how he views it that that's the word picture that he wanted to express to us uh, through the prophet hosea and um how he feels about idolatry is how we feel when our spouse would commit adultery and so i wanted to ask the question um why did the Israelites fall into idolatry? Uh, because they did. You, you keep reading throughout the, the prophets, and they do fall into idolatry. In Jeremiah, they, the Israel was divorced, right? So why did that happen? I mean, it, it seems so clear, you know. Uh, God did all of these amazing things. He brought them into the land, and he blessed them. Uh, he gave them provision, gave them wealth, uh, gave them rain every year uh, for their crops, and, and yet they, they broke these commandments. They did go after other gods. And so um, I want to submit to you that um, there, there's multiple reasons, uh, but uh, some of the reasons uh, are found earlier on uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, starting in uh, chapter 8, um, verse 17 if you guys want to follow along it's deuteronomy 8 17 and it says beware lest you say in your heart my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth you shall remember the lord your god for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day and if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, you, sh you shall uh, perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And so right here we see that it starts out with this idea of forgetting the Lord. It starts out with this idea of complacency and, and pride, you know. We, we, we get to this uh, place in our lives where we don't remember that it was the Lord. We stop thanking Him for uh, our jobs. We stop thanking Him for where we are in our lives, and instead we worship ourselves, which is uh, idolatry. And and we, we say that, oh, well, I was the one, you know, I was the one that uh, it was by my hand, by my strength that I moved up in this, in the world, that I moved up to this position in the world. And so it starts out by uh, pride and forgetting the Lord. And so, but I want to submit to you guys that, that it goes even deeper than that. Uh, because remember, uh, uh, God compares idolatry to adultery. And so, as Pastor Jim always says, you know, that, you know, whatever happens in the physical, there's a spiritual message. And so, um, 
so he compares this to adultery. So what, what happens in, in actual marriage you know, when, um, when a, a spouse commits adultery? What, I mean, there's multiple factors that play into, um, that, play into that, uh, that horrible thing that, that uh, you know, brings such pain and destruction that God compares to idolatry. And what are the factors that play into adultery? And so, um, so this is all connected, because uh, what, what uh, is, is a really obvious example of the Israelites taking, because it says, that, you know, you shall not worship the Lord, your God, in the way that these pagan nations worship their gods. So what's an obvious example of that? We know um, in the golden calf, the golden calf uh, back in Exodus, um, when uh, the, the Israelites literally did that. They, they took something from Egypt. They, took a, a, they made an idol uh, out of earrings and made a golden calf and worshiped the Lord with it. Uh, Aaron said, tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. And so, um, so I wanted to kind of unpack that a little bit and, and kind of uh, submit something to you guys uh, because that just seems ridiculous to me. I mean, it was 40 days after God himself spoke to the Israelites, spoke from the mountain. It was this incredible spiritual experience. And God, like, like none other, like none of us have probably ever experienced. God's never audibly spoke to me. I don't know about any of you guys, but, but it was an entire nation of people that God spoke directly to. They had a direct spiritual experience that was incredibly powerful, um, a, a direct uh, experience of God. And so, and then 40 days later, um, they commit adultery. 40 days later, they commit idolatry. Uh, and God told them not to. I mean, it, it, it was 40 days before that God said, don't make idols. And they did. And, and so, um, so I wanted to suggest to you guys um, that the reason why uh, Israel committed adultery against God, the reason why uh, they committed idolatry, was because their foundation for their relationship with God was not on the covenant. Their foundation with, uh, for their relationship with God was based on a spiritual experience. It was based on what they got out of the relationship. It was based on, you know, God giving them manna. And, and, um, and when they didn't get what they wanted, you know, they complained and, and you know, we see this all throughout the Torah. So their relationship wasn't founded on the covenant that they made with God, you know, because it was a covenant. They said, whatever the Lord says, we will do. It was a marriage ketubah. It was for better or for worse, um, you know, and richer, uh, richer or poor, and in, in, in sickness and health. And so, um, so what happened? They, God spoke to them. It was this crazy, amazing experience. They're like, I love you, God. Just, I, I, I do, I do, I do. You know, I submit myself to you. Whatever you say, I will do. I will serve you, God. Um, and it was based on the, the spiritual experience that they were having at the time. They, they agreed to this. And so in, in the same way, uh, like our physical relationships that we have today, the physical covenants that we make today, uh, the most obvious one is marriage uh, between two people, they, uh, a man and a wife. Um, you know, how often do uh, marriages fall apart? How often do people uh, seek especially in the world today, they, they seek to get what they want in a way that is not uh, honorable to the covenant that they made uh, because their foundation for the relationship is wrong. Their foundation is not in the covenant what they made, uh, on the, the, the covenant that they made with that person. Their foundation is on uh, an experience. It's on how good they make me feel. It's based upon, you know, how... Uh, how much they provide for me, whether or not they have a job and they're able to provide for the family, you know, and, and you, know, you know, 
a few years down the road, they, you know, are acting like a jerk, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm not sure I love you anymore. I, I don't feel the same way that I felt about you back when you made me feel so good all the time. Now you're not making me feel so good anymore. And so, you know, I, I don't think I love you anymore. And that's the attitude that we have uh, towards one another. And so... Um, it's the same way with God, because what the Israelites did was they tried to recreate a spiritual experience. They tried to recreate a worship service, you know, because God gave them this spiritual high, and, and then they went and uh, tried to recreate that, tried to have that again, tried to, uh, you know, establish, uh, you know, because we all want that. We all want that in our relationships. We all want that intimacy, uh, with, with when, if you're married, you want that intimacy with your spouse. You want that. Um, you want those emotions and those experiences. And God gave them to us, and they're good. The same way with God, uh, we want to have that intimacy with God. We want to to have those spiritual experience. We want to be able to enter into His divine presence and praise Him and worship Him and fall on our face and and cry and and all of those things are really great. But if we go about it in a way that he has told us not to do it, it's adultery. It's idolatry. And so the way, just like in a real marriage, you don't get that intimacy and those things that you so desire to have in your relationship by um, demanding it or by getting frustrated that they're not giving you what you want. No, you get them uh, naturally, by being faithful to the covenant, if you put that other, per if you put your spouse first, if you serve them sacrificially, love them sacrificially, love them in the way that they desire to be loved, then you naturally cultivate those feelings of intimacy between yourself and your spouse, and and it comes naturally. And everything that you wanted out of the relationship that you've been trying so hard to get, like, and you've been frustrated that you're not receiving it. It comes naturally when you're faithful to the covenant first. And I, I would even go one step further than that. <clears throat> Doing as much marriage counseling as we have in working with men is what I've learned is the cyclical pattern. God works in a cyclical manner. Um, and what I have seen through my own life first through that experience is um, by honoring the covenant is the spiritual head of your home if you are loving your wife as Christ loved the church, then you are giving and you are loving. In other words, you are seeking to fulfill her needs. There's no independent behavior in that. Yes. Okay? So you're seeking to fill her needs. I can tell you this. I used to, to just argue for myself and go, you know, well, I'm, I'm, you're not doing this for me or you're not doing this for me. You know, all self, self-centered, you know, this. And what God taught me was, if I am doing as the head of the house and as the stronger vessel, I am meeting her needs and loving her as Christ loved church, what happens in the cyclical pattern of that, when it comes back around, I'm actually getting the very things that I had fought, wanted to fight for. Those things were returning to me. And, and that's the way it, it works in that covenant. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen the movie Fireproof? It's a, it's a Christian movie, awesome movie, definitely recommend it. But that is this uh, concept. Uh, I mean, the guy, he started out, you know, just really, it was an incredibly unhappy marriage, fighting all the time in, in the movie. And, uh, and he was so frustrated, you know, talking to people, getting advice and, and considering divorce. And he's like, I just don't understand. We're just, she's not the same person anymore. You know, I, we don't have that same kind of relationship that we once had. Uh, and um, then, you know, his, I guess it was his father, right, that gave him the book, uh, the love book, the love challenge, I think is what it, call, it was called. I don't remember, but... Yeah, yeah, and and so he started putting these things into practice, and and ba basically the book was the Bible. He might as well have just give him, given him the Bible because that was it was these biblical principles of sacrificial love, as Pastor David was just saying, loving your wife as Christ loved the church, and and loving her uh, sacrificially 
without expecting anything in return. You know, at, at the very beginning of the movie, he was just beginning to implement these principles, and he made like a this you know really fancy you know uh, dinner for her at the house and lit candles and everything. And she came in and she's like didn't respond the way that he wanted and he's like ah, I just don't understand and <laughs> and and it's because he was loving to return uh, to get something out of return yeah but when you as pastor david said when you love sacrificially when you uh, as he learned you know and he was faithful to the covenant cuz what else did he do he threw away the computer that he was looking at porn on all the time uh, which was a tremendous uh, stumbling block, a, a tremendous wedge in between them. And, and so he started being faithful to the covenant, being faithful to her, uh, and throwing away the, uh, the computer and also loving her sacrificially, which automatically brought restoration and healing in the relationship. And it's the same thing with God. If we want that intimacy with God, if we really want that uh, powerful spiritual experience like none other, uh, we have to be faithful to his covenant. Being faithful to his covenant, being faithful to his commandments, walking, it's the daily discipline. It's Job's faithfulness. You know, when Job, uh, what was the false accusation that Satan had against Job? The false accusation that Satan had against Job when Satan was talking to God was, Job's only faithful to you because you bless him. Job's only faithful to you because you protect him from harm. And that was, and Satan has that same accusation against all of us. It's the same false accusation. Uh, are we only faithful to God when things are good? Like, so we need to be, we need to be able to say, Baruch Hashem Adonai, uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, he gives and he takes away. We need to be able to be faithful to the covenant. What is the covenant? For better or for worse in rich or poor, in sickness and in health. That is the relationship that God desires to have with us. And, and, it's, and it's through the trials and tribulations, as Pastor Jim always talks about. Uh, it's through weathering the storms that, that true intimacy is established uh, between us and God. And, and even in a, a, the marriage analogy that we've been giving giving this whole time with two people. It's the same thing. When you weather the storms together, it brings about intimacy. Yeah, I think sacrifice too, it's not words. Sacrifice is an action, like love is a verb. Um, when, when you're sacrificing, um, when you're, you know, that's like faith without works is dead. You know, if you have faith, if, if, you, if I tell my wife I love her, but I never do anything to show her I love her. Well, what good is that? She doesn't feel loved. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to, on this note, then uh, might go on to another topic. We'll see uh, what. The, well, I was going to touch up on some of that is. idolatry. You know, there's some really cool things that you were that you know opened up about that in in twelve two uh, talking about the, and we'll read that after you get done with that. But okay, if you want to? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm up for whatever. <laughs> Um, are you guys blessed by this? Is this uh, awesome? Well, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so, even if you weren't blessed, I'd still say Baruch Hashem for better, for better or for worse, right? So, uh, <laughs> all right. So, I just wanted to to say too, you know, in uh, to continue on with this marriage analogy that we've been given giving this whole time. Uh, it also means being faithful in the little things. Because uh, God has, I mean, how many of you guys read the Bible and it's just totally bizarre? Like, you just don't even understand why the heck God would say something like that or why he would give a certain command. I mean, like, don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. It's like, okay, I won't. Um, I mean, and, you know, if you're, if you're, an Orthodox Jew, I guess that would mean don't eat cheeseburgers. Like, but I really wanted that cheeseburger. Um, but some of the Orthodox Jews think that means don't eat cheeseburgers. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but it, 
But we need to be willing to be faithful to God, uh, even in the little things, and, and trust him. Be, because, you know what, it's the little things that matter. How often do you guys say, you know, how often, it, it's always the little things that matter in our real, in our real relationships with each other. It's, it's the little thoughtful things that people do that, that really make a lasting uh, impact in our lives and really bring us closer. And I submit to you guys that it, it's the same with God. I mean, we're created in his image and, and, you know, everything that happens in the physical, there's a spiritual message. And so I submit to you guys that even the little things, if you don't understand, you know, why, you know, you shouldn't eat pork, you know, do it anyway. Because God says it, he command it. He, it matters to him. It's important to him. And so um, we need to be faithful uh, in those little things. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, when you were talking about idolatry, it just it really stirred me some things that I'd read. Um, if we can go to uh, 12, 2, it says, um, You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall pos- dispossess serve their gods, and on high mountains, on high hills, and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash them to pieces, their pillars, and burn their uh, ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods, destroy them out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose. So what was really eye-opening to this for me is there's a term called secretism. I think is what it's called, if I said it right. But what it means is to blend uh, religions. And so the Father was really warning them before they crossed over of the idolatry. And I uh, was giving them, you know, warning them very gratefully and telling them that, look, go and tear this stuff down and leave it desolate. Do not build, because this is something that was done all the time back in these days, what archaeologists are finding, you know, uh, dis- they're, they're discovering, where they're finding religious um, monuments and they're finding where the next power that comes into the area, they put their monument on top of that. And it just continues to pile up. Even um, Hadrian, the emperor, built pagan temples on top of the Temple Mount. So he is, he's saying that when you go over, you tear this stuff down. And, and I did. I started wondering, okay, well, if there's nothing there, then what really matters? And I started doing some research on it. Just like at Mount Sinai, you have the golden calf. And they, there's actually, um, on the rocks, there's drawings of the golden calf and, and different things that display what actually went on there. The same thing in these, these uh, places where the uh, pagans did sacrifices, killed uh, their children and so forth. There's actual drawings around these places on rocks. That, so God you know, is so uh, protective that he didn't just want you to, to destroy everything. He didn't want you to be there to see the influence to see what actually took place there. As he said, don't worship me in the ways that they did. So he knew that them even seeing these drawings probably would stir curiosity, you know, and, and some of that probably actually uh, took place. But um, it's, it's almost like you being on a computer. I mean, you, when you're on your computer and you pull up a website and you got the sidebar over there, you know what I mean? That you're like... Phew what is that doing there? I mean, you know, sometimes it might not be, you know, um, undressed people, but it is permissive. It just doesn't look good. And you have to see that to be on that page. So, you know, I, I really believe God, he just went to the greatest extremes to protect his people. And, and we all know it ended up happening. Uh, they, they ended up worship, worshiping him in their ways. But it's just to show you that that God loves us so much. He's given us the way for our protection. But again, he's given us choice. You know, he's given us choice. And it's so easy to walk out that door, and like I said earlier, and be inundated by the way of the world. Um, our job is to be filled up with the way, be transformed by his word, that we can walk in a paganistic society and be the influence instead of being influenced. And that's what God desires of us. Uh, the, the whole word, and I get it now, the charity. What, are we being charitable with what we're given? 
Are we giving away the very thing that he's pouring into us to help change the lives of the others? Yeah. Um, and that's, that, I mean, if we're not, that's the, that's the call to the church, is to be a witness to a lost and dying world. We're going to be, in fact, in Acts, what is it, Acts 1-8, I think, where it says, um, I might be wrong, um, but it says, go forth and you shall be my witnesses, right? You shall be. He didn't say, so what I take from that is you're either going to be a good witness or a bad witness. You see what I'm saying? So when people see you, they should see the light. And if they're not seeing the light, we need to, my saying I like is back the truck up. We need to reevaluate. Yeah. Yeah. So I I wanted to move on to this next uh, portion here. And I know Pastor David will have a lot to share about this. Uh, But it's the next portion of the, the Torah that really stood out to me. Um, well, I, I, <laughs> I just, I just feel it in my heart, man. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's the next portion of the Torah that, that really, uh, the next passage that, that just really stood out to me. It's on the theme, uh, we covered faithfulness and I really wanted to cover the, the theme of generosity that is really expressed, uh, in this Torah portion. And so if you guys want to read along with me, it's, uh, Deuteronomy 15, starting in verse 7. All right, you guys all there? All right. Um, If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest there be any unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near. It was, uh, the seventh year is referring to the sabbatical year uh, and you're, uh, to release people from their debts um, on the, every seven years in Israel. So, uh, so the seventh year... Uh, the year of release is near. Um, because, you know, if he gave them, like, gave him a loan or, or uh, gave him sufficient for his needs right before the seven year, you know, he's basically saying, well, I'm not going to get paid back. You know, and God's saying, no, don't even worry about it. Like, don't even let your heart, God calls that an evil thought. Don't even let that evil thought cross your mind. He says, um, okay. Take care lest there be any unworthy thought in your heart and you say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cry to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Now, there's several things that I want to point out here uh, from this passage. Uh, Number one, we're commanded to meet our brother's needs, whatever those needs are. Uh, So look to the person on your right and ask them what their need is. And then, no, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) But, uh, uh, we're commanded not to harden our hearts towards those in need, okay? If your eye looks grudgingly, which means you have a a bad attitude about it, uh, if your eye looks grudgingly on your poor brother, you could become guilty of sin. It says, uh, you know, if if you have a bad attitude about having to give to somebody, you're guilty of sin. Uh, And he cries out to you, you're guilty of sin. And then the fourth one is this commandment comes with a promise that if we follow this commandment, we'll be blessed by God. And so uh, one point that I wanted to make about this is that uh, giving generously reminds us that we depend on God's generosity. So why should we meet, or why should God meet our needs if we don't meet the needs of others? And so what this command really does is that it develops within us the character of God, you know, because we're all selfish. I am, you know, uh, a lot of times. And 
And so uh, I need the character of God to be developed within me. And, and so what this commandment does, what, what this uh, particular part of God's word does in my life is that it, it commands me, uh, it, it's, command, it, it's an inward motivation. He's like, don't even have a bad attitude. That's like an inward thing. Yeah, and so, you, um, so what it does is it changes our character so that it matches God's character. And so there's an interesting parallel in, in Matthew 6, too. Uh, and I have to thank uh, Brother Robbie Conway for originally pointing this out to me. Uh, but this is cool. It says, uh, uh, Matthew 6, starting in verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is unhealthy, it says if you have a begrudging eye, if your eye looks grudgingly, you know, to your poor brother. Yeshua says, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, grudgingly, you you have a bad attitude about what God's telling you to do, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So this whole thing is connected here. This is the, uh, I believe personally, this uh, Yeshua is unpacking these commandments in in Deuteronomy and and, uh, uh, um, preaching on them, saying like, listen, um, don't worry. God is your provision. You know, we're commanded to be faithful with what he's given to us and to pour ourselves out. Isaiah uh, 58 talks about pouring ourselves out for the poor. Uh, You were talking about um, pouring yourself out, you know, that we are filled up to pour ourselves out uh, during the worship service when they were singing that song. And so when God provides for our needs, it's so that we can pour ourselves out uh, for the poor. Um, and in the context of Isaiah 58, it even goes on to say that you are the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. We are all called to repair and to restore uh, this broken and fallen world, and part of that is through generosity. And so one more point I, I wanted to, to really bring up that really, uh, that really uh, convicted me personally um, is that poverty is not only a physical condition. You guys know that, right? I mean, it's probably the most obvious form of poverty, the beggar on the street corner. I mean, it's, it's obvious that that person's poor, you know, but, but there's also poor in spirit, as Yeshua says. You know, there, there are people that, uh, that are poor emotionally, And so in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 15, when it says, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be, his need could be emotional. You know, there there are hurting people all around us. Um, You know, and and Yeshua, you know, he he talks about spiritual principles all the time uh, from the physical commandments. You know, he he touches the heart. You know, uh, when when he talks about don't commit, he says, you heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. So I submit to you that likewise, you know, there's a physical commandment here to meet the physical needs of people. No doubt about it, but there's also a spiritual aspect to this commandment, that we are to pour ourselves out for the poor in spirit. We are to pour ourselves out for those who are hurting emotionally, and we are to do it without a bad attitude. Now, that's that's what really convicted me, if I could open my chest, as Pastor Jim likes to say, uh, is, you know, I... I struggle with impatience and, and selfishness uh, so often. And, and people, you know, they message me on Facebook or, or they, they call me or text me and I 
I don't text them back, you know, uh, and I, I don't, you know, I notice that something's just kind of off with a person, and I, but I don't really spend the time to at, like say, how are you? No, really, how are you really? I don't, uh, I don't do that enough. And so if any of you guys can relate with no, that. I th- I've done that. I've actually had people come up to me and say, um, how are you doing, man? How's it going? I go, do you really want to know? Do you have a minute? It's like, no, well, yeah, not, not now. I just want to see if you're doing okay, dude. So <laughs> yeah. that's how we are. You know, we, are, we, we do that. We, do we really care? Uh, and a lot of time we don't even, do, how often do we determine the need of others? It says in their need, yeah. not the need that you determine they have. Um, Hillel, uh, the Jewish sage, uh, he, um, there was a man that had a chariot, and he, he uh, had this nice chariot. He was wealthy, had this nice chariot, and people would run alongside the chariot, and I think he would, he was, he would be charitable to the ones that were running beside the chariot. I can't remember if that's what I said, or they just ran beside the chariot. However, he lost everything. And so Hillel, you know what he did? He got him a chariot, and he ran in front of the chariot. Mm. I mean, do you hear how powerful that is? Yeah, yeah and it's, it's awesome, uh, too, because that's what it says is the giver is the one who is blessed. Because right here uh, at, that we just read, uh, this commandment, if we follow this commandment, it comes with a blessing. The bless, God blesses us when we are generous, uh, both physically and spiritually. When we minister to somebody, you know, it, it changes lives. I mean, it, it could, someone could be, to use an extreme example, someone could be on the verge of suicide and you would never know it. But if we don't pour ourselves out for the people, for the poor in spirit, what does Yeshua say? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. If we, as the kingdom of God, don't minister to the poor in spirit, um, it, could, it could be devastating. And uh, we are, like Isaiah 58 says, you know, we are to be the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. And it's in the context of pouring yourself out for the poor. And so when we do that, when we do that, we're, we are repairing this broken world. We are, um, I mean, the fact that you have to minister to somebody presupposes that they need to be ministered to you, There's, uh, ministered by you. There's something broken. There's something that needs to be repaired and restored. And so I don't know about you guys, but nothing makes me feel better than really just someone encouraging me, someone really taking the time. You know, I could be so depressed uh, and just feel so isolated and alone. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a, an emotional guy and, you know, I, I get that way. Um, and, you know, even, you know, even when I'm around a bunch of people, you know, you ever feel like, even when you're in a group of people, when you still feel alone, like, it, it's just, uh, doesn't make any sense, but, you know, our, our so many of us are, are hurting in that way. And so I just want to, uh, want to encourage you guys to, to really spend the time to minister to people, really, um, really pour yourself out for people. And if you are hurting, also, you know, you need to, to make, that, uh, make other people aware of that, you know. Because as I said earlier, you know, um, emotional and spiritual needs are not as obvious as physical needs. You know, uh, it's obvious that the beggar on the street corner is in need, but it's not so obvious when we are in need emotionally. So really make yourself uh, vulnerable and and go up to your brothers and sisters and and tell them, like, brother, I just need a, a word of encouragement. You know, I just, you know, I... I'm, I'm just insecure about how skinny I am. Will you tell me that I'm not ugly? And, you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't, I'm not insecure about that. I don't care. But, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we really need to, to make those needs known, too, to, to our brothers and sisters. And so. Uh, That's really good. It, 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 you just hit so much in, in saying what you said because, um, a common equation I see, and this responsibility really is is 
the Mishpachah's responsibility. Um, if, if we're reaching out to people, um, you know, there's some people that are very um, social, there's, they're very extroverted, and there's the, the introverts, right? That they just, it's harder for them to connect. It's just, um, they feel insecure. Um, and what I found out is uh, there's an equation the enemy uses. And what it is, is insecurity or rejection leads to offense. Unchecked. It leads to offense. Offense is the gateway to deception. Yeah. And, and isolation. And then after deception comes in, isolation kicks in. It's um, uh, the whole analogy of the herd. You know, in Yellowstone, you can watch the wolves fight or go at the bison as a pack. And they try to, to, to get the pack to run and, or the herd to run. And eventually, one will cut the wrong way. And the rest of the herd will go the right way. And so this one's isolated. Then the, the wolves come in and the pack, they can kill it. They can't kill all of those. And so that's what happens is when we become deceived through offense, we tend to isolate ourselves. And once we isolate ourselves, that's when spiritual suicide kicks in. Yeah, and uh, it even says in a, uh, that's so awesome. Uh, you guys all need to memorize this verse, uh, Proverbs 18.1. It says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own destruction. He rages out against all sound judgment. And so that has two, uh, there's two responses to that that, that we really need to, uh, uh, as we're talking about this. One, if you find yourself feeling rejected, as Pastor David's talking about, if you find yourself with these offended feelings, you need to reach out to someone. Don't isolate yourself because isolation leads to destruction. According to Proverbs 18.1, you rage, you seek your own destruction, and you rage, against, uh, rage against all sound judgment. And two, we as the mishpacha, as the body, we need to be the ones to notice. We need to be aware of the hurting people that are all around us, uh, the people that, that aren't, uh, that feel isolated, that feel rejected, that feel um, like, alone. And if we notice that people are feeling that way, we need to reach out to them too and, and pour ourselves out for them. Absolutely. Um, you know, perception's reality. It's, it, we're, you're not to even judge uh, where they're at, but they perceive what they perceive, and it's their reality, even if it's, it's, it's not true and the enemy has come in and deceived. Um, like I say, I mean, the gate right there where, where the offense is, you have the gate to walk through. What does God teach us to walk what? Matthew 18, right? That's to restoration, to recovery. But so often people walk in a fence right through the gate of deception. And that is just where the enemy can come in and he can inundate you with thoughts and I, like the isolation and so forth. And I've seen so many people that will actually, the spiritual suicide, they, they will actually quit things or leave things or to think that they're punishing the people that have offended them and they actually are killing themselves spiritually getting away from just getting away from the mishpaka or getting away from their congregation or, or a group of friends or whatever it is and and so I, we here as a body need to be in tune to this and we need to look at it and we need to try to recognize it because this is how the enemy divides the body. And this is how it happens. And we should have a deep desire to make sure that we're reaching out to everyone. I mean, if you see this in someone, go to them. It, I, it would be better for us to go to someone and go, brother, are you okay? I feel like um, I sense something's going on. And then go, are you crazy? Everything's great. Good. But it would be better to take that chance than a brother to walk away into sin. It's, it's really important. Yeah, that's so good. And um, what's interesting too, and if I can just in, in really encourage you guys to, to really take this to heart and to really, to really try to see, to ask people how they are and, and to try to notice when someone is hurting. And uh, did you guys know that uh, if you read a little bit later uh, in it talks about the feast days. And did you guys know that God actually commands us to be happy? 
And he says, uh, in the feast days, uh, particularly uh, the uh, feast of Sukkot, it says, you are to rejoice in your feast. And so it's a, it's, it's a commandment to be happy. Uh, and so, so, you know, for, for those of us who are celebrating the feast of Sukkot this year, let's really be intentional about this. When we know, I mean, we have all the time in the world, we're all camping, we're all with each other every day. Let's really reach out. Let's really try to... Um, because we have the time, what else are we going to do? I mean, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> so, um, really, really be intentional, and, and uh, you know, you're commanded to be happy, so minister to people, make sure that everyone is happy, and, um, and pour yourself out, and take these principles, these biblical principles, uh, seriously. And it's loving your neighbor as yourself. One of the greatest two, the, the greatest two commandments, right, that everything else hinges on is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbors yourself. What the enemy does so often is, because he can't create anything new, is he will either twist or distort or, or flip. So how does he flip that scripture? Love myself more than I love you. Yeah. And that is... The tendency we have with our nature is to love ourselves more than we love our neighbor. Um, there was another that caught my eye, uh, I think it's 1228, where it says, Be careful to obey all these words that I command you, that it may go well with you and with your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the sight of your Lord your God, in his eyes, do what is right. Not in our own intellect and leaning on our own understanding and doing what we determine is right i mean think think of it this way like if, if you have anybody ever been to new york you ever see that jumbotron there at um times square have you it's, it's it is human you can actually 20 blocks away you can see people on this thing what if your life and what you're doing is on that jumbotron all the time Think about it. I mean, we're in a society that cares so much about pleasing people. You know what? We care so much about... I, in fact, I would even venture to say that, you know, I may treat you differently in a group of people than I would in private. It's for, because we're so worried about... Uh, why that is, I don't know. But we are so uh, worried about how we appear to other people. And so what, um, we, we, what God's wanting us to do is remember that everything is in his eyes. He sees everything. He's omnipresent. There's not a cubic inch here that he's not present, you know, between us. And so everything that we do, uh, we should do and remember that he is watching and we should do it in, 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 as, as, as if he's standing right here uh, and, and living that out before him. Uh, I think that is very important that we do that. Does everybody uh, feel blessed by God's word? I, I do. I, I think the theme, I think the God, what God gave in worship, that was, that's really cool, that, that the charity, the generosity, that's what this whole thing's about today, I think, is he's reminding us to be generous to our brothers, care about their need, not what you think they need, but meet them in their need, care enough to go and speak to them and love them. Be, be care enough about your culture that you're filled up that you can go pour out the love of God to your culture. That's what God is trying to teach us here today. So, with that, let us pray. Father, I thank you so much how you work and how you bring forth um, themes that you desire for your people to hear. It's so wonderful that you love us so much to do that. Father, I pray that tonight, as we all sit here and we all hear these things and, and it pierces our heart, Father, that it won't, it, it won't, the fire won't go out, but we'll leave here with a, a deeper understanding of what it means to, to not mingle and mix with this world, not to uh, take on idolatrous practices, Father, to 
to be generous to those who are around us, those who are in our midst, our own brothers and sisters. Father, may we never be a people that just turn our cheek or turn our eyes the other way because we just don't want to deal with it. May we be a people who want to deal with the problems that our friends are having and the problems that our neighbors are having. And Father, I pray that if, if we don't even know our neighbors' names, that you give us a desire to walk next door and make that connection, that we may begin to pour out and it's not in our strength. If we're just willing, if we are just willing to go forth, you will empower your people. We've seen that so many times. That if we just step out, you do the work through us. You're looking for people who are willing. The laborers are few. The harvest is, is, is large. So Father, give us the heart to pour out to pour out what you have given us. We praise you this evening. We thank you for your holy Shabbat. We thank you for our Mishpacha. We truly are family. So may we love like family. Change our hearts, Father. In Yeshua's wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Go ahead. Um, just uh, pray a blessing over you guys. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance over you. And may he give you shalom. Amen. And may you be blessed this evening. And if you're watching online, join us next week. If you are going through anything in your life that you need help with, please write in and we'll do our best to get to you very quickly. And um, we love all of you and thank you. Thank you for logging on. Be blessed. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you and God bless.